So one of the, I'll start off by just telling you a story about my first job where um, I was interviewing for my first job and uh, it was very interesting to, uh, to do. And I was looking, one of the places I went to was the University of North Carolina where I ended up eventually, but not as my first job. And uh, I met one of the most distinguished um, researchers and scholars in, at the university, a man named Floyd Denny, who became a, a very good friend later on in my career. You know, he was the, if you all know about uh, uh, penicillin and prevention of rheumatic fever, that's Floyd Denny's work. So he, you know, he's a remarkable person. So I interviewed with him, you know, as a young guy coming in looking at family medicine. Floyd says to me, so uh, what's your area? And he had this real thick South Carolina accent. So he said, what's your area? And I said, well, I'm a family doctor. And he said, no, no, I mean, what's your area? And, and what I realized is, I couldn't answer that because I didn't have an area. I mean, I, I was basically looking for a job as a teacher and was interested in a lot of things. But one of the things I noticed from your bios is you're already, um, you already have an area, which is, doesn't mean that, and we'll get into this, but it doesn't mean that's where you need to stay, but it's kind of, that's where you need to start. And certainly like anything along the road, it's the kind of thing where you can change it as you, as you go along. Can I hit this? Oh. How do I get the next one, Nancy? Yeah, you'll have to tell me next slide. That's sort of the downside of me doing next, this. Next, please. Okay. So this is one of my favorite definitions from a very wise man who I met uh, about 35, 40 years ago when I was really struggling with what kind of career I was going to have. And uh, we asked him about, uh, you know, his career. And his career had been long and distinguished and mostly working behind the scenes. And um, he said, a career is a series of accidents and unexpected opportunities upon which we stamp a retroactive label, which should be reassuring to all of you, because when people say, what's your career going to be, you don't know. You know, it's like Steve Jobs is famous for saying, you, you can connect the dots going backward, but not going forward. So part of it is you can talk about what your career has been up until now. So if I was to tell you a little bit about my own life and so on, I could tell you what I've been up until now. Now I'm in the next stage of my career and what I'm going to be, I don't know. And that is a good thing. This continuing renewal uh, of your life and career doesn't mean that you're wandering all the time. It just means that sometimes uh, you bump into things. And my story, which I won't tell you particularly because it's not that interesting, but is I had lots of things that just kind of popped up as opportunities. And I ended up um, grabbing many of them and then finding that that was really a positive thing for me. Okay. This is, I love this quote. This is, gives you an idea of, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago in Osler, everybody knows about Osler. And he said, teacher's life should have three periods, study until 25, investigation until 40, uh, profession until 60, at which retire on double allowance. I was all for that. Um, it didn't work out, unfortunately. But I think that the idea that Osler was saying is there are periods of your life. Now, which one of those you're in, I think you're in the investigation period. You're you're through your, well, you'll study for the rest of your life, but investigation um, is the part of your life that you're in now. And part of what investigation is all about is scholarship. Okay. So when you talk with folks about, and I do a lot of work with people and have with, uh, I, I forget which one of you took the UNC fellowship, but um, you know, I helped, I started that at UNC fellowship back in 1980. And, and one of the, this is, I'm, I'm cribbing this from a lot of those notes. So uh, one of the nice things about running things is you can take notes as you're going along and you become smarter, hopefully over, over time. But this was a really important thing to kind of point out to people. It's obvious, but it's important when you're looking for a job and when you're in a job, which is they need to know the type of institution that you're part of. And the, one of the ways that, that people have divided up academic institutions is whether it's a, a research institution, uh, community-based institution like um, ones that are, are uh, often in community hospitals or one that's mixed. And, and the vast majority of medical schools in this country um, are the mixed kind. So what you'll see is people who are on tracks. And the track thing got started about 40 years ago. And so I, uh, you know, I, I managed to get through before they decided about tracks. Um, and so the track determines somewhat what you're going to be doing and the training you need and direction you're going, but also, um, you know, the institution itself. So if you're part of a, a big R research institution, you need to be 
thinking about how you can work and partner and potentially um, collaborate with some people who are doing that kind of research. And community-based institutions don't, it's not that they don't do research, but they don't necessarily have uh, a system of promotion and tenure that values, um, you know, NIH funding and external funding and things like that. It kind of speaks for itself, but you've got to sit down and, and think, what kind of institution am I at um, as a way of helping yourself look forward? Okay. So an academic career, and this is, again, I cribbed it from 40 years ago, it still works, um, is that this is kind of a very simple schematic about what you end up looking at your career. There's an apprenticeship period, which often um, is, for us, it's residency training or fellowships uh, right out of, of um, residency. So it's the, it's the postgraduate equivalent for what people do in some of the basic sciences, social sciences, and so on. It's a, you know, a, a, a residency and a PhD are not comparable for a lot of different reasons, but it's that period of growth and, and individual um, understanding of yourself and differentiation from your past and so on and so forth. That's what this apprenticeship is all about, learning from people who are going to teach you skills and then you can take those skills and go forward. The, the next period, and often coincides with people's first uh, promotion, and in most institutions there's a time limit on that. So one of the things I always tell people is whenever you move from one institution to another, read the small print. Uh, when does your promotion clock begin? You know, what are some of the criteria for promotion? What are the things that um, people will look at as evidence of accomplishment? And what do they define scholarship by? Because scholarship is, I like scholarship a lot. I don't like research. I mean, I do like research, but scholarship is a broader term and a lot of you are involved with scholarship that is not necessarily research, but could do that. So that period of life, that first job, that first period, the, the, the run up to promotion is um, a time when you learn to do things on your own. You take responsibility. I always love to talk with people who went from a residency program to a faculty job and say, you know, one week I was the senior resident on the service and I was asking my attendings about all sorts of different things. And then the next week I was the attending. So there's this kind of shock value that happens, but it is autonomy and it is a responsibility that we all have. This idea of a career anchor is a really important one that I've seen over the years. And, and this gets at what we're gonna talk about a little bit. Um, a career anchor in the first period of your life is something that um, you end up feeling comfortable about, knowing something about. You don't have to be an expert, but you're somebody who has depth. And then um, it's something for which you are known. And a lot of you alluded to this in your personal statements, which uh, I talked to Nancy as we were starting about letting each other see each other's personal statements to get a sense of interests. Um, you don't have to lock in on something, but during this first period of time, one of the things you need to do is to become good at something. And that's your career anchor. That's an anchor as a starting point, not an anchor as an end point. Um, then, you know, what you do is get promoted and suddenly people go from being a junior faculty member to a senior faculty member. And it's always disconcerting for folks when I would send them notes saying congratulations on your promotion. You know, I knew Nancy when she was getting ready to be tenured, got tenure, and all of a sudden, well, she had been doing this all along, but um, she was responsible for other people's careers. So you go from being someone who's responsible for your own career to someone who is responsible for other people's careers. That's, that's what the teaching part of this work is all about, and it's a lot of fun and it's enjoyable, and it's hard, and it's complicated, and it's all those things. But it really is a thing that you have to look forward to. So, you know, it's a little arbitrary when promotion says, oh, you know, and you're now an associate professor. That just means you're responsible for others, not necessarily solely yourself. And this idea of being a statesperson just means um, stepping away from the organization that you're part of and looking more broadly. And that's one of the things that organizations like the STFM do for you. It's not to make you a statesperson, but you begin to have a sense of the larger issues so that your issues and your local and parochial struggles that you go on are not necessarily local and parochial. They may be um, much broader than that. And so part of the rationale for engaging in an organization like STFM and looking at leadership possibilities is that you become more of a statesperson, or at least have a larger view um, and you come back from meetings and you say, you wouldn't believe what they're doing in California. You wouldn't believe what they're doing in Arizona. You wouldn't believe what they're doing here. 
And that's the fun part, but that's also the part that gets you to be a statesperson. So that when somebody says, how are we gonna solve this problem? One of your instincts is, let's find out what other people are doing. Okay, next. So this career anchor, a little more definition, is it's the thing that will sustain you for that first intense period. Um, it really requires you understanding yourself. You gotta sit down and say, who am I? What am, what am I good at? Particularly in a scholarly uh, point of view. So if you're gonna be known for something, you really need to know, um, uh, you know about that particular topic and um, you need to be able to understand what your strengths are to, so you bring those strengths to that topic. Um, the thing you have to look around when you do a career anchor is uh, what resources do you have to help you? So there's local resources and regional and national. One of the reasons to get again involved with big systems, big system, big organizations that are national or regional um, is because you meet people from other places who are doing things so you can start to partner with. And uh, one of the things that people talk about all the time in the literature on women and in particular looks at is that women have struggles with finding mentors that, that are, are good matches. And so what I'm always saying to people is just because you're part of a residency program, a department, uh, you know, a university, whatever, doesn't mean that you have to look just there, that you can have, especially these days, I mean, you can have conversations with mentors all over the world, literally. And, and the people have been the most important in my life have been people from other countries actually over the years because uh, I, their reading and their writing and their, their talking with me have been remarkably important and helped guide me. So you need to look more broadly, look around your local, say, who can I work with? This, um, if you got an idea and a project, can I grab a resident? Can I grab a colleague? Can I grab somebody from another department? Can I grab somebody that's local? And then if you see something that you are, tr are drawn to in the area that you're particularly interested in, that maybe that anchor, um, look around the literature. And one of the things I'm always telling people is pick up the phone and call people. <laughs> you know, it's like if you read something that's interesting and it really relates to what you're doing, pick up the phone and call them. Um, people love to get phone calls about stuff that they've produced. You will too. So do it and it will get you all sorts of wonderful help and no one will say, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you now because I don't do that. So remember this little thing called a telephone. I guess I'm, I'm looking more like a telephone, it would be something like that. But anyway, pick up your phone and call people. Um, and then this question of how it aligns with your job description. And I don't wanna do this right now, but I want you to think about this, which is each of you has a job description and you allude to some of that in your um, personal statement as well. And without getting into details, uh, one of the things that you express or interests in, you know, women's health, border health, um, medical student education, you know, you've got a whole wide range of things. Is that related to your job? So one of the things that's really important to do, which is a simple notion, is study the things you're doing. So if you are running a clinic, get knowledgeable about, um, uh, you know, clinical improvement and get knowledgeable about ideas that are creative ways to look at clinical practice, look at things like payment system, look, look at something about that work that's interesting to you. If you're somebody who's doing residency education, understand some element of residency ed education very well, make that part of your anchor. If you're interested in a particular clinical area, a couple of you talked about women's health or um, uh, Nat Natalia was talking about this border health. Be really good at that. Um, uh, you know, make sure that, that um, uh, it, but it has to be part of your job description because the worst possible outcome is to have an air, the job description and have this thing you really like, which is over here, which has no relationship. And I'm not quick enough to move from one to the other. I, I'd end up, so if you look at the, what I've written over the years, mostly what I've done is written about whatever I was doing at that point in my life. And, and uh, that's helped me. It's keep me a little bit on track. And so align your scholarship with your job description. And then the other question you ask yourself is how does this scholarship area that you're interested in fit with others in your department? So are there people in the department, particularly senior people or people with more experience who could be good mentors? And will your area be valued? So um, one of the things about family doctors is you, we can do just about anything and study just about anything and all that kind of stuff. But the important thing is to ask the person who is your direct supervisor, the chair, the residency director, others, 
Um, I'm interested in doing this kind of stuff. I want to try to start working um, in a scholarly way in this area. What are your thoughts about that? So go early and often to the person who is responsible for you. And if they say, well, it's interesting, but it's not really what we're focusing on in our department, then that should be a message you need to listen to and then figure out a way to help align that with the department as well as your own interests. Okay, next, Nancy. So how to build an anchor, become a scholar. You do not become an expert. I really don't like the term expert. When they talk about somebody who really is an expert, one of the dangers about becoming an expert is it narrows you and it locks you into something that you may want to change in the future. So um, being knowledgeable, becoming a scholar, being someone who can be gone to by others, your colleagues and others as, as a source of information is great. Um, but if you become an expert, that's dangerous. At least that's my particular bias. Read widely. Don't just read the family medicine literature. Don't just read the medical literature. Read the other literature out there. You know, um, you all have different ways of reading. It'd be a wonderful study to do. Again, it was done and done. God, it must be 25 years ago about how faculty members read. I haven't seen anything like that since. But it would be fascinating to know how and what you read. But do read widely. Don't sit. And for heaven's sakes, if you're writing something up, this is an editorial comment, don't say little is known about whatever it is you're talking about. That shows that you actually didn't look very carefully because something's known about everything, okay? Don't use that phrase, at least if I'm gonna review it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you could do teaching um, to align uh, your scholarship, that's great. I mean, in other words, teach what you know, teach what you're good at, um, be a scholar of that and be somebody who to write it up is always the thing that I'll tell folks and then find ways to present and teach what it is you're doing beyond your own department because one of the things you're going to need in your life is to be able to be recognized by people outside of your department as someone with with uh, skill and knowledge and and a scholar of something and use use an area ironically that is uh, maybe a focus use it to, to broaden you so one of my favorite things, for example, is when you read about education, there's a whole world, there's schools of education, you know? And somehow when we look at residency education, we look at this very narrow little focus. How does that fit with education in general? So look at the educational literature, not the American Academy or American Association of Medical Colleges, but look at education and look at journals in education and business and places like that. And then the most important thing is keep it in perspective because, as I said, the danger is if you pick an anchor, that's great because it helps you feel good about yourself. It helps you pro pro progress in a positive direction in your career. But um, don't get hung up on it. And for heaven's sakes, don't become the expert because that's exhausting. And family doctors are, you know, interested in lots of things at different times in our lives. And so expertise may be something that you have for a while and something and then move on. Bye, Natalia. Have a good time. Okay. So from junior to senior faculty, um, and you're not at this point, but some of you are going to get there fairly quickly. It's ironic when I talk to people who are in fellowship roles, they said, well, I'm a, an assistant director of a residency program, but I'm going to potentially be the program director in a year or two. Well, that means you're a senior person. If you're responsible and you have, um, you know, a, a supervisory role. So, when you're thinking about change, and this is for another conversation maybe a few years from now that I'd be happy to have with you, you need to think about, and I always put it in this way, is what conversation do you want to be part of in the next period of your life? What do you, anyway, what's the conversation you want to be part of? I mean, the story I tell is I, ended, I was very happy being a professor at the University of North Carolina. I was doing good things. I enjoyed my life. But I felt a little bit like I was not part of the conversation that I wanted to be part of, which is what's the future of my field and my discipline? And one of the ways to do that is to become a chair. So the reason that I went to Wisconsin to be a chair was I wanted to be part of the conversation about the future of our discipline. And chairs, by definition, have to be part of that. So, uh, but before you make those changes, understand what you're doing um, now. It doesn't mean you have to abandon it completely. It doesn't mean you have to keep it up and not let go of it. There are these change points, opportunities, um, takes the skills that you used in that anchor and put it into something else. Um, use different conversations and broaden it. And one of my favorite stories was a colleague of mine who was a, a SDFM president after I was, and um, she was the chair at a number of medical schools, um, did a good job, was not particularly happy in that role, 
And then this thing came along where she had an opportunity to become a president of a college, a small college, uh, which happened to be the place she was an undergraduate. And she called and said, what do you think about being a president of the college? I said, that sounds really cool. That sounds really interesting. You know, and if you could do a chair, you could probably do a resident. You know, some colleges are smaller than some departments. So she ended up being a college president for over 15 years, which was a great thing. I was very happy. So you can apply your skills into different fields in different, dis in different areas as well. Okay, Nancy. So these are the tr couple of things about what makes an academic career successful that I can predict um, what your productivity is going to be. If you talk about productivity as being things like journals, presentations, um, you know, invitations to come and so on, um, it's predictable. Um, the institution that you're working in will help decide what that productivity is. But I, again, I'm advising you to think about having this career anchor, being known for something, being a scholar of something that helps you become someone that people want to hear from and that you can engage more broadly in the, in the field. Um, organizational factors uh, influence productivity. I mean, one of the things I'm just overwhelmed with is how busy all of you are in your lives. And right now, it's just like a nightmare. I have no idea what's going on. I've been out of the clinical enterprise for since they kicked me out because I was a danger to my colleagues by going to a clinic and getting COVID. And then I said, you know, this is the end. So a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my peers said, you know, this is the end because it was a natural and, and, and you know, kind of a decision point. But you are busy. You've got a lot to do. If I read your, your job descriptions, one of the things I'd be counseling you is pick a couple of things that don't do so many. Uh, and, or do, do all the things, but do them in sequence. Don't do them, you know, simultaneously, things like that. And how you, you know, how you structure your time determines your productivity. And you got to know about scholarship, when you do it, who you do it with. Maybe you have writing groups. Maybe you have uh, every, you know, when I started out, um, which was a godsend, I had no idea about how to do this. I started a brand new residency program because they were all brand new in those days. And somebody, my colleague at my clinic said, well, what afternoon do you want off? I said, off? They said, yeah, you know, everybody's taking an afternoon off. That's what doctors in practice do. And I said, really? So <laughs> I had an afternoon off, you know, and I did most of my writing and most of my other stuff, reading and things like that on my afternoon off. But I kept it sacred and I switched it to a morning. That's another hint is for me. I get up early in the morning and I work hard and, and I poop out by kind of, 1.30, and afternoons have a way of blending into 1.30, 2.30, 3.30. So if you're going to take some time off for scholarship, do it in the morning would be mostly my suggestion, but okay. And uh, so here's just a couple of points that faculty interests do change over a career, and age is not a predictor of productivity. I've, I'm, more product, I'm more productive from a scholarly point of view in the last 10 years of my career than I was in the first 40. So I don't know what that's all about, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and that happens a lot is when you're getting ready to retire, move on or whatever. People suddenly get very productive. Maybe you want to leave a legacy or something like that. Being coming a mentor and a sponsor is important. Um, and being and having one for yourself is important. So um, I was fortunate enough to have people who, uh, <laughs> who would call me and ask me to come and be a visiting professor. And I was only five years into my career. And I thought, well, that's really nice. Well, they were trying to recruit me. That was the business. But they also uh, wanted, gave me a chance to put something together, and I presented it. So I still have a copy of what I presented as my first you know, invitation. And then uh, the productivity over, over a career is affected by the security and the challenge. So both of those are necessary. And you know, we talk about time. We talk about all sorts of things. The thing that comes out of every analysis of everybody when they talk about leadership, about scholarship, about anything, is uh, that uh, uh, it comes from within, it doesn't come from without. So me standing in front of you saying, you better write this up, you better write this up, is not gonna get you to write it up, probably. It's what's inside of you, and maybe I can help you with that, but you have to become the, the person in the, in the, in the, and you and your people you're working with have to have that, that drive um, in, from inside of you to be able to write it up. Okay, last one. This is actually Jeanette Southpaw, who some of you know, I don't know if you, she's a wonderful longtime colleague of mine and just retired as a chair at Pittsburgh after 20 years. Um, put this together when we were doing a, a piece on faculty development, I don't know, this is like 30 years ago. And she put the schema together. It's a wonderful one and Nancy can send you the slide. But these are all 
the kinds of things that go along with different kinds of jobs, all of which, depending on what you want to do and where you want to go. I'm not, let me just say that department chair is not a culmination of one's career. It's a job you do. It's not who you are. Whoever you are is persisting through all these different things. You know, since Nancy moved, she's been doing much more administrative things, much more mentoring, and so on and so forth. So she kind of moves down towards the right-hand side of that. Um, so if you look at um, this diagram, it's helpful for me because it's a way of putting yourself on a continuum. And you can move back and forth because I know people who have been department chairs who are now back into practice pretty much full time in their, in their departments or doing student work or doing other kinds of things. So you can go up and down this continuum. This is not a unidirectional one, but it's a very helpful thing. At least I find it to be helpful so you can take a look at it. All right, that's the end of my spiel. 